episode of Palisade Radio. We're here at the Palisade Jekyll Island Conference. I'm sitting down with one of our speakers from today. His name is Mike Beck. Mike, thank you for coming to the conference. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mike uh, is a newer person in our network. He's somebody I just met a few months ago. Uh, his background is something that I find very interesting. We talk about uranium a lot on Palisade Radio, and Mike actually bought an asset with a group of investors back in the last uranium cycle for $4 million, ended up selling it to Arriva for $2.5 billion just a few years later. Mike, I think that's a good place to start, just getting a little background on that story. Yes, well, it, there's a lot of luck in this business, right place, right time, and we got interested in uranium in 2005 before the price had really moved and we don't like exploration risks so we we scoured our archives for uranium deposits that had been drilled out in the previous boom and we found one in in Africa that had been drilled out it was very large it was low grade so it needed a much higher uranium price than was prevailing at the time but we had a view that uranium price was going much higher for lots of reasons at the time and in fact, um, it turned out to be the case. Two years later, uranium price went up almost 10x, and correspondingly, the value of the asset went to what was transacted, which was a two and a half billion dollar transaction. And it was really driven by entirely by the uranium price because the deposit, even though it was low grade, um, was profitable at uranium prices above 55 or 60 dollars a pound, and and the price uh, peaked at $142 a pound. So it, we, it was fortunate and we, we sort of see the same thing, the same storyline unfolding, different, a slightly different dynamic, but the same sort of theme with battery metal um, materials. And that's been our focus the last uh, 18 to 24 months. Let's talk about the battery metal space. You just got done giving your talk. And um, the first question I want to ask, because most investors are wondering this, at what point in time will a car that runs purely from electricity as opposed to gas become at same price parity or cheaper than buying a gas engine car? That's a good question. And um, it, 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 I think the consensus view uh, now, um, and it's changing almost monthly, um, and, and it's, it's changing um, to, to come in closer in terms of parity between electric vehicle or EV and internal combustion engine, ICE, as, as the industry calls it, um, is that in the EU, for example, um, parity will be achieved in 2021, 2022 for diesel and maybe a year later for petrol in the US 2023 and in China 2024. Um, I think um, that number is going to be pulled in closer. I saw some credible study and analysis just last week that suggested in fact that in the EU uh, cost parity between ICE and electric vehicles would be achieved as early as next year for diesels in 2019 for for um, for petrol-powered uh, uh, passenger vehicles. And that's being driven by rapidly improving price performance of batteries. And as the batteries get cheaper and um, more, more powerful, um, that number just gets pulled in. So I wouldn't be surprised if um, in the next 24 months it's cheaper in, and not too long thereafter that is cheaper in Europe to buy an electric vehicle than it is to buy an ICE and at that point you have no reason uh, to buy anything but an electric vehicle because the economics dictate that it's it's not only cheaper to own and operate but it's also um, better for the environment so um, why would you buy an internal combustion engine when it's going to cost more and and be dirtier and so that, that date's coming and it's coming fast and I think it'll, in some jurisdictions, it'll be here within the next 24 months and, and I think even in the U.S. within the next three years and you, you see it, you see a, 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 a bit of it now with the if and when uh, the Tesla 3 rolls out, um, that's a game changer because therefore a, a, a vehicle um, 
that costs thirty-five thousand dollars, you you can get something that satisfies the requirements of ninety-five percent of the of the consumer base. So why why wouldn't you buy it? It's it's cost competitive, and it's certainly cheaper to operate than a gas-fired um, vehicle. In the scope of this conversation, I want to just focus on the metals that you talked about. People think of many metals associated to the battery space, things like manganese or vanadium. You focused on three metals that you're keenly interested in. We, we did. So we, we looked at um, what goes into the battery packs um, in terms of, of metal raw materials and the, the principal ones um, of interest to us are lithium, cobalt, and nickel. Um, if you take lithium, for example, a Tesla Model S 70 kilowatt hour vehicle uh, consumes 63 kilograms of lithium carbonate. If you assume, for example, uh, that, and, and these, are, these are rather staggering numbers which, um, which got our attention and I think will increasingly get the attention of other investors, but if you assume that 25% of the passenger vehicle market um, goes electric, the world is going to need something on the order of six times current lithium mine supply, six times current cobalt mine supply, and twice current um, nickel supply. And if you, if you segregate the nickel market into class one, class two, you're going to need three times current class one nickel production. And those are rather staggering um, incremental demand figures uh, for um, an industry that typically grows two to four percent per annum. And uh, these, these sort of growth profiles have dramatic implications for the pricing of these commodities, the shortages that are likely to, to result in the amount of capital that's going to have to be allocated to deliver that capacity that's going to be needed by the battery makers who in turn are going to need to supply the vehicle manufacturers. And you, you see the announcements coming fast and furious. Volvo announcing, I think, uh, by 2019, they're ceasing production of all internal combustion engine vehicles. Every vehicle will be either electric or hybrid. General Motors announcing that, I think, by 2023, all of their models will be available in electric or, or gasoline. A Volkswagen announcing that by 2025, 25% of their vehicle sales will be electric. China announcing a target for next year that 8% of new vehicle sales have to be electric and 12% in, in 2019. So um, if you do the math um, and, and you multiply out 85 million passenger vehicles a year times the quantity of lithium, cobalt, and nickel that's needed for each of these vehicles, and that's all incremental demand that doesn't exist now, it's on top of existing demand, you end up with some pretty staggering figures. Somebody told me that nobody has seen a growth profile in a metal like this since the invention of tinfoil in the early 1900s. And um, so it's an exciting time to be in the mining business. And, and we're focused really on these three metals, um, lithium, cobalt, and nickel, because we, we think that they're there will be major price move, movements as, as shortages emerge, and, um, and it's an interesting uh, spot for an investor to be. So Mike, let's talk about how you and your investor network are going to get exposure to these metals. There's different factors that go into cobalt and lithium, and the same for nickel. Why don't we start with lithium and talk about how you're invested in the space? Yes, yeah, so we, we, we look for opportunities um, that offer asymmetric risk reward and we we like to acquire massive large-scale deposits we're a little bit less um, concerned about grade our, our view is that if if the underlying commodity price is going to be rising substantially that the commodity price will will offset the lower grade so in the case of lithium our pick is a company called LSE lithium which was IPO'd in February it has a market cap of 150 or 160 million Canadian dollars. We like it because um, they own the largest portfolio of lithium brine acreage in Argentina, and arguably the largest uh, are the largest private holder of lithium 
brian acreage in the world so in our view lse lithium offers unparalleled leveraged exposure to lithium price and as lithium price goes up um, because their resource base is and their footprint is so large their their share price should go up commensurately so so that's our lithium pick lse lithium Cobalt, you made the statement that you are quite firmly in the belief that the price will go to $100 and above. Right now it's around 30 How do you play Cobalt? Because Cobalt, everybody knows, is a byproduct of nickel and copper production in not very stable jurisdictions. Yeah, so the, Cobalt is a challenge for just that reason. There really aren't um, any notable pure cobalt plays, or at least that offer the sort of leveraged exposure that we prefer. There is one recent offering. It's a, it's a new listing. It was an IPO in June or July. Um, I think it was a $230 million IPO of a company called Cobalt 27. The ticker is KBLT. And it's, a, it's an interesting one because it, it, it has a market cap of something on the order of $230 million, but it's underpinned by $200 million of physical cobalt metal sitting in warehouses and and cash on top of that. And the company is in the midst of, of negotiating streaming deals with producers, pr principally nickel and copper, that have small cobalt streams to give further leveraged exposure to the metal. So we, we own Cobalt 27. We like it because it's a pure, unadulterated exposure to cobalt. And as cobalt price goes up, particularly as they add streaming um, deals to the portfolio, um, the stock will go up as well. And, and it's a pure play. The biggest producer of cobalt in the world is, is Glencore. And, but cobalt's a fraction of their portfolio or their product mix. It's probably less than 10% even at current prices. So. So while cobalt is a bit problematic in terms of investor exposure, uh, this new offering, which is sort of like a cobalt ETF uh, on steroids, um, cobalt 27, that's our pick. Excellent. Let's end with nickel. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say, but it seems to me you might be most excited uh, by nickel just based on the opportunity that you've come across, uh, which is getting access to a very large scale, low, lower grade, I shouldn't say low grade, but lower grade deposit in British Columbia. Yes, yeah, so nickel is, uh, is kind of interesting. It's a little bit different than cobalt and lithium. Cobalt and lithium are niche uh, metals. Uh, the, the lithium market today, total mine supply is 200,000 tons, which is, which is about 1% size-wise of the copper market. Cobalt's even smaller. It's half the size of lithium, so it's 0.5% of the cobalt of the copper market by volume. But nickel is a is a much larger volume metal. The total mine supply at the moment is about 2 million tons, so um, that's rather substantial, even though it's only 10% of the copper market. We, we don't think investors yet have realized the impact of electric vehicle adoption on nickel demand, but if you, if you look at the numbers and you assume a 25% penetration by of electric vehicles by 2030 the market's going to require an incremental 2 million tons of nickel that's to put that in context it's that's the entire nickel mine supply today so it's going to have to double but it's even more problematic than that because the battery market needs what's called class 1 nickel class 1 nickel today is about a million tons so the market's going to have to grow that in the next 13 years at an EV penetration rate of 25% by 3x. So um, people haven't gotten onto it yet because the nickel price, while it's moved a little bit, it's not moved enough to, to get um, the attention of the investor community, which is a good thing for us because it allows us to get exposure. So we've been looking aggressively at acquiring nickel exposure and uh, we like asymmetric risk reward um, we like to find deposits or investment opportunities where the upside is 10 or 20x but the downside is only minus 50 percent and we think we found one it's called giga metals it's listed on the tsx venture exchange 
It has a minuscule market cap of $14 million Canadian, but it happens to own the second largest undeveloped nickel cobalt sulfide deposit, which is located in British Columbia. When nickel prices were much higher in the last part of the price cycle, the, the company had a market cap of $150 million. And when nickel prices collapsed, it collapsed. But as nickel prices come back because of the size of the resource, this stock will come ro roaring back. So if nickel prices go to $10 a pound or greater, and we think they will, um, as this demand unfolds, driven by electric vehicles, um, there's no doubt in our mind this is going to be radically repriced and uh, a company that has a market cap of $14 million now will be, uh, pick a number, $200 million uh, or more comfortably just because of the massive size of the resource. So that's our, that's our favorite exposure. We just, our only disappointment is we can't find more of them. Um, and we've been looking, uh, but, um, but Giga Metals, we think, is just uh, the most mispriced nickel asset um, in the public markets today. Yeah. Well, Mike, the uh, scope of this conversation is far short of where it could go. There's so much I could talk to you about, but this interview does have to come to a conclusion. So we'll get you back on the show here soon. Really appreciate you coming to the conference. Thank you very much. Thanks for having. And and I think the format and the speaker mix you've had has been wonderful. And and uh, it's it's good to hear um, the different speakers with their different uh, metal focuses. And and thank you again for having me. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?